And here to talk Canada-Mexico relations, Andres Rosenthal. He is founding president of the Mexican Council on Foreign Relations. And we're happy to have you at TVO tonight. Thank you very much, Steve. It's well, a pleasure to be here. Yes, we do have something called NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. But I suspect most Canadians, when thinking about that three-way partnership, tend to think about the country to our immediate south rather than to our much further south. So one of the reasons we wanted you here today was to tell us about this third amigo. Why is it important for us to remember Mexico if we're up here in Canada? I think there are several reasons. Uh, the first reason, of course, is that NAFTA is a tri-national free trade agreement in which Mexico plays a very important part for Canada. Uh, trade, investment, Canadian presence in Mexico, Canadian companies in Mexico, the amount of Canadian goods and services that go across over the U.S. into Mexico and vice versa. Other reason, tourism. Over a million and a quarter Canadians go every year to Mexico. They may not go to Mexico to know Mexico, but they go to Mexico to enjoy the sun and the beach. And also because I think uh, we have more in common with each other than we probably both have with the United States. Canada and Mexico On do? many issues, on many issues, for example, on the international agenda, on the regional agenda. So I think it behooves us to be closer. Oh, give me a handful there. What issues do, do Mexico and Canada have more in common with than we do with the states? Well, over the years, I think we've had uh, issues like uh, peacekeeping in various parts of the world, uh, particularly in the hemisphere, uh, our preoccupation with what has gone on in Honduras, which now today seems to be on its way to being resolved. But it was an important issue in which the foreign ministers of both Canada and Mexico uh, formed part of this OAS mission that went to Honduras to try to find a solution. We've worked together on issues of law of the sea in the UN. We've been members of the Security Council together. Uh, we worked on disarmament. There are a lot of issues on which I think we see eye to eye on many things uh, with Canada, which isn't to say that Canada doesn't have or shouldn't have its own bilateral relationship mm -hmm. with the U.S. just the way we do. No, I understand that, but I think, I mean, one of the things you're about is trying to get people to remember that this is a three-way relationship, and there are many things that we can do as a trio that perhaps we can do better than just as duos. Absolutely. For example, what? Drug trafficking, organized crime, migration. These are three issues which cross borders, and they cross borders within the, all of North America. Canada and the U.S., Mexico and the U.S., Mexico, Canada. We have an immigration issue, which uh, led to the visas being required for Mexicans, unfortunately, but that was the decision taken by the Canadian government. We work very closely together on fighting uh, organized crime and drug trafficking. Uh, that's also a trilateral issue. You can't solve that bilaterally and hope that the other third party, whoever it ha happens to be, is going to be able to automatically be part of that. I don't know if you have been enjoying as much as I have been enjoying reading all of the op-ed pieces in the newspapers about what you have written and then what some others have written as a former Deputy Prime Minister of Canada who's written a piece, former Chief of Staff to a Prime Minister and an Ambassador who's written a piece. Here's, here's a little bit of that one. This is Derek Burney, the former Ambassador of the United States from Canada, saying, Mr. Derek Burney said Ottawa should return to a more direct relationship with Washington by instituting regular meetings with the U.S. President. The Three Amigos process could continue but should become secondary in the Canada-U.S. relationship. Mr. Burney, who helped negotiate the free trade agreement and who served as Canada's ambassador to the U.S., said that while he continues to believe in the North American free trade agreement, there are many other issues in which the three countries have such different views that little gets done. Should we in Canada be focusing more on our bilateral relationship with the United States? And as he suggests, Mexico maybe belongs on the back burner? I don't think it's an either or issue. I don't think it's a zero-sum game. Uh, the U.S. and Canada have a very important relationship uh, as members of NATO, NORAD, other things, and Mexico and the U.S. have a very important relationship. But I don't think that that impedes us doing many things together, the three of us, such as facilitating business flows, trade flows, human flows in certain cases where there is no reason to say that, you know, you, you have to sacrifice your bilateral relationship in order to have a mm. trilateral one. Yeah, but you know, politicians but, have a finite attention span and bureaucrats yeah. have a finite, you know, they, you can't do it all, right? I was both, so I know, <laughs> I know about attention spans, <laughs> okay. but I can, also, I can also tell you that from my perspective, and, and perhaps this is just a unique way of looking at it because I've had a lot to do with the Mexican-U.S. relationship over the years, I don't believe in this 
uh, myth of a special relationship. The U.S. has 190-some special relationships with almost every country in the world, depending on its interests. Canada has been looking historically and permanently to emphasize a special relationship that, from my perspective, doesn't exist. Canada has a very important relationship with the U.S., no question about it, economic, social, cultural, all sorts of things. But from there to say that, you know, the U.S. is always going to be our friend and our, our, our ally doesn't work. And, you know, I was here three, four weeks ago at a CG conference, and what did I see? McLean's had its cover story, Canada's worst enemy, colon, America. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> I, I saw you at that conference, and I know you had a good time with that. But I'm going to ask the control room. Let's flip ahead to the, from uh, the Financial Post board. I want to go to that later. Let's do the Globe and Mail board here, because you've hit the issue of the special relationship now. So let's follow up on that. Here's John Manley, former Deputy Prime Minister of Canada, and Gordon Giffen, former ambassador from the U.S. to Canada. Our friends, and they're talking about you there, Ambassador Rosenthal, our friends seem skeptical <clears throat> that Canada and the United States share a special relationship. We assert that this is a unique bilateral relationship, a model in international relations built over many decades based upon similar values and democratic institutions and common heritage. We are two of the oldest democracies on earth, U.S. and Canada. We were partners in liberating Europe in the Second World War. Together we confronted communism during the Cold War, assuring our mutual defense as partners with Europe in NATO and with one another in the North American Aerospace Defense Command. I know what you just said, but what you said flies in the face of a great deal of conventional wisdom in this country and I suspect even in the United States. How can you say we don't have a particularly special relationship beyond what you say 190 other countries may have with the U.S.? I would distinguish, Steve, between unique and special. There's no question that it's a unique relationship, just the way ours is. We're both neighbors. We both share a border with the United States. We share a great deal of commonalities, and we share differences. The fact is that one thing is to say that our relationship is unique, and the other is to expect that the United States will treat us in a special way because we are a unique relationship. Uh, we saw it very clearly in the case of Canada. I'm going to stick to the Canadian, uh, the Canadian issue for the moment. We saw it very clear in the Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative. Uh, Canada said, because of our special relationship, we shouldn't be required to show passports when we come and go across. Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't. Right. We have to show passports. Why? Because it's a security issue which the United States considers priority, and therefore it is going to apply it equally to Canada and Mexico. When Janet Napolitano takes office as uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, she says the Canadian-U.S. border has to be treated the same way as the Mexican-U.S. border. Boy, Canadians went ballistic over that they one. They sure did. Well, but that shows you that there is no special quote-unquote relationship. There is a unique one, and on occasions, such as a NATO alliance or NORAD or other things, there is a very close relationship. On other things, softwood lumber, Buy America, all of the issues that are on the agenda between Canada and the United States or between Mexico and the United States remain because those are the interests of the United States. I mean, it is kind of impressive, though, that for almost 200 years there hasn't been a shot and anger fired across that border. It's the longest undefended border in the world. Doesn't that constitute something special? Unique, again. <laughs> unique, okay. I'm going to insist no on the here. uniqueness okay. because I think okay. it's different from being special. Fair enough. I mean, you know, when, when President Obama took office, he in one week said that our closest and most important relationship is with Canada, Mexico, Israel, Russia, China, India. Every one of those is a uniquely special relationship for the United States because it represents specific threats, friendships, alliances, trade relationships, whatever. Uh, you know, we have uh, 20 million Mexicans living in the United States. That's almost a tenth of the U.S. population. Mm -hmm. That's a very important part of a special relationship because we have that Hispanic body of people who, as a matter of fact, thanks to them, Obama's president today. Uh, that makes it also a unique relationship. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the United States is always <laughs> going to look at us benignly and say, no. whatever you want goes. That's for darn sure. We know that. Okay. Let me read you something else you're not going to like. Uh, here's from Diane Francis. Who, I uh, like everything. Uh, okay. And yeah. I like Diane. I know her well. Some, something you may disagree with then. And she writes in the Financial Post, frankly, she says, the problem is Mexico, talking about the three amigos. Three-way trade has been beneficial for all concerned, but Canada's relationship with the U.S. should be decoupled from Mexico's 
so that the two rich neighbors can take the next important step, which is to form a customs union. This would be mutually beneficial, but is not happening because Mexico is not ready for this due to poor governance and deep socioeconomic impediments. When Mexico get its act to, gets its act together, it can join along with other hemispheric neighbors who are ready, such as Chile. I agree with everything she says, except the next to last sentence, which is that there hasn't been a customs union between the U.S. and Canada because of Mexico. I don't think that's true. Uh, there hasn't been a customs union because the U.S. has very important trading relationships with many other countries around the world. Of course, with us, the two of us, Canada and Mexico, are the most important ones. But in order to form a customs union, you then have to renegotiate things like uh, the free trade agreements that they have with uh, South America, with uh, Israel, with the EU, others. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's holding up a customs union or a next step NAFTA plus. Where do we go after a pure free trade agreement? But I don't think it's fair to put the blame of that on Mexico. I don't think it's a question of us getting our act together. As a matter of fact, we have more free trade agreements uh, with uh, third countries than either the U.S. or Canada. Hmm. Let me read uh, a list of things here under the heading of an asymmetrical relationship with your country, which your country and mine has with the United States. But let's focus on the U.S.-Mexican relationship right now. The U.S.'s gross domestic product is 18 times greater than Mexico's. Average wages in the U.S. are six times higher than in Mexico. In the Mexican-American War in the 19th century, Mexico lost half its territory to the U.S. Mexican nationalism was constructed as a reaction to fears of American invasion. That according to Andrew Seeley, Andrew Seeley excuse me, uh, from the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And again, some will look at those numbers and say, boy, those point to the need for a more bilateral rather than trilateral relationship because the relationship is so asymmetrical. To which you would say what? To which I would say every relationship is asymmetrical. I don't think that, that... one really is. Well, yes, I mean, it, it is in terms of, of economy, in mm -hmm. terms of scale of economy, but it's also a great uh, opportunity. Uh, and that opportunity has been seized by both Canadian and American companies to locate in Mexico, to invest in Mexico, to use Mexican labor, which is cheaper, to uh, have access to Mexican technology and uh, productivity. Uh, Bombardier has opened a factory in Querétaro uh, to make airframes for their uh, Challenger jet. And they say that it is the most productive factory they have ever seen in terms of the way that they've trained the Mexican workers and the way that they're operating. I think, I think that rather than to look at it from the negative point of view, uh, the way you present it, I think one should look <laughs> at it from the positive point of view. Uh, let me take North America, not necessarily. North yeah. America yeah. could be so much more competitive on the global scene, vis-a-vis -vis Europe, vis-a-vis -vis Asia, vis-a-vis -vis even South America, if the three of us got our act together and began to take advantage of our mutual comparative advantages, rather than saying, oh, we're so different that we can't do anything together. Now listen, Canada has uh, done a lot of investing in Mexico. There is an enormous amount of trade that goes back and forth between Mexico. So somebody must be understanding that there is comparative advantage to be taken from a three-way relationship. Uh, not in everything, again, I repeat, but in many things. And I think that that's the way one should look at this. Well, let me follow up on something you touched on earlier, which was the border. We both have, your country and Canada both have border issues with the United States, but but pretty different border issues, right? I mean, why? So the question is, why would Canada um, want to negotiate trilaterally on border concerns when ours are all about, you know, making sure that border is as light as possible so we can get our goods into the United States? And their border concerns with Mexico are all about, you know, keeping Ill illegal immigration down. Not all about, but we have mostly an, about. We have an equal. We have an equal interest in in thinning the border in terms of being able to move the goods and and the people legitimate people that come and go. And we've been working together on finding um, recommendations to the three governments about how to do this. As a matter of fact, John Manley, the author of the op-ed you cited some time ago, was a co-chair of a task force that the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, the Mexican Council on Foreign Relations that I headed at the time, and the Canadian Council of Chief Executives under Tom Daquino, mm -hmm. task force which recommended 65 different ways in which the Canadian, Mexican, and U.S. relationship could help facilitate the building of a North American community. Uh, 
uh, not on the European model. We don't want to follow Europe. Europe has other issues. But a community where people identify a subregion of the Americas where we have decided, the three of us, to put our eggs into a common basket. So we don't need a common currency? I don't think so. Okay. Uh, the American Hispanic community is growing by leaps and bounds. Naturally, and here we're going to get into this unique versus special again, naturally many Canadians think we have a, let's not argue about it, a unique and or special relationship with the United States. But as that community in the States grows, the Hispanic community I mean, do you see a day coming when the U.S.-Mexican relationship transcends the Canadian-American relationship? In some ways, I think it already has. Uh, having this very large uh, group of Hispanics, most of whom are Mexican, uh, has transformed in many ways uh, the United States as a country, uh, not only demographically, but culturally in terms of music, in terms of food, in terms of language, language all sorts of things. Uh, I think that you know, we don't have a very large uh, Mexican community in Canada, but it's a growing community of, uh, of the legitimate, shall we say, putting aside the issue of of the uh, fraudulent asylum seekers, but people who decide either to come here to live or to study or to work, uh, and, and that makes a big difference. And there are many Canadians now who, rather than just going to Mexico for a week, a year, are buying second homes and deciding that it's a good place to settle after they retire, and so on. And all that impacts enormously the socio-political makeup uh, of, of our three countries, and we have Americans who come to do this, more than a million of them, who come to settle in Mexico as retirees. I think that it's not a question, I think we should try to avoid, Stephen, really, this issue of the either-or, the, the Manichaean way of looking, okay. black and they, white. You're, you're think, really not going to like my last question there. We've got a minute <laughs> left, and let me ask you one more. Canadians, you've, you've told us already, a lot of them go down to Mexico for vacation, and um, and we do hear a lot about the drug wars that are going on in Mexico right now. And we do know that, of course, as a percentage, it's a tiny percentage, but there have been some particularly grisly murders of Canadians traveling in Mexico. Uh, are you concerned that all of that is damaging our, the way we look at Mexico? Yes, of course. I think, uh, I think it, it's unfortunate, just like having slapped a visa requirement on Mexicans changes the way Mexicans look at Canada. And uh, I think any of those things that happen uh, that are either picked up by the media or in some cases even, I'd say, exaggerated by the media, uh, end up harming perceptions, public opinion. Uh, Canada has always been seen in Mexico as a great friend. Uh, there is an enormous sympathy for Canada. Sim Canada, because of, we're both neighbors of the U.S., because we do share issues and problems and so on, the Mexican relationship with Canada has always been Hey, special. <laughs> and the fact is that it's very different from the relationship we have with France or, I mean, Spain. We have a historical relationship, linguistic. With Canada, we have a very special relationship, especially with Quebec, because of the Latin character, if you like. Well, everything that happens, whether it's in Mexico and affects how Canadians look at Mexico or in Canada, the way Mexicans look at, at Canadians or Canada, is unfortunate, and I, I would hope that these very isolated incidents, including the visa issue, which I don't think is a long-term impediment to a good relationship with, uh, with Canada, should be looked at as what they are, isolated, small, and a tiny percentage of the overall picture. Ambassador Rosenthal, it's awfully good of you to join us on TVO tonight. Thanks very much. Thank you, Steve. A pleasure.